Welcome everybody to Liberty Baptist Church. We are glad to be in the house of God and glad to have you all with us. Got some visitors from Solid Rock Baptist Church in Berlin, New Jersey today. Let's see if I get their names right. Ilana. And then um, we got Brother Garrett and Brother Ethan over there. And then also Brother Justin in the back. So we are glad. We are thrilled that you guys are here. And I'm glad to have you uh, with us to worship the Lord tonight. Uh, Brother Jesse's going to get us started with some songs in just a moment. And uh, but listen, as he starts singing, you know, from his heart up here, let that reach your heart in the pew. And let's sing to the Lord tonight. Let's just focus in. Forget any trouble you had throughout the week. Forget any trouble you had earlier in the day. We're on the winning side. Amen. So let's pray, and Brother Jesse, you'd come. Lord, please bless this service. I pray you'd meet with us now. I pray that you'd help us to hear from heaven tonight. And uh, Lord, I pray you'd be with Pastor Gates as he's away. Lord, I pray you'd bless him. I pray you'd use him greatly. And we love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand with me if you're able, and let's turn over to page number 362 in our hymnals. Page number 362. 62. Excited to be in God's house here tonight on a Thursday evening. It's going to be a great day. We're off to a good start already. I saw Brother Harrison handing out chocolate bars before service. So, I mean, that's not a good start. I don't know what is. Courtesy of Miss Angie. Miss Angie, you're a blessing. We love you. All right, so let's sing it out in this song. There's power in the blood on the first. Would you be free from your burden of sin? I hope you are. Let's sing it out on the first. From the burden of sin, there's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood. From your passion and pride, there's power in the blood, power in the blood. Come for a cleansing to Calvary's side, there's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, underworking power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, underworking power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Wider than snow, there's power in the blood, power in the blood. Sin stains are lost in its life giving flow. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, underworking power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, underworking power in the precious blood of the Lamb. your king. There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily his praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Singing page number 468. Excellent start to our service here this evening. Joy unspeakable. All right, listen. If you guys can't get excited thinking about joy unspeakable, yeah, then yeah. there's then there's no hope. I mean, come on, man. We I, I want to hear you guys singing. I want to hear me singing. Amen. Listen, if you had a hard day, ready, and you don't feel like singing, here's here's all you do. Ready? Tell your flesh to shut up and sing. That's it. Ready? Everyone, look at your flesh right now and say, shut up and sing. Just shut up and sing. You know, I swear, if I could actually kick myself, you know, if I could like spin around and kick myself in the flesh. I would do it all the time. Because this flesh, man, it gives me so much trouble. But but joy unspeakable, man, heaven is real. Come on. Heaven is all, it's just, it's just out of reach. It's just on the other side. Amen. We're so close. The Lord is closer to coming back than he's ever been. And listen, we, we've got something to shout about, amen. So let's sing this one with some oomph. Tell everyone, the person next to you, to sing with oomph. That's right. You tell your mom, Brother Harrison. <laughs> there you go. All right, let's sing it out in the song, Joy Unspeakable. I have found his grace is all complete. Let's sing it out on the first. I have found his grace is 
all complete. He supplieth every need. While I sit and learn at Jesus' feet, I am free, yes, free indeed. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory, full of glory, full of glory. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory. Oh, the half has never yet been told. page number 658 heavenly sunlight page number 658 <clears throat> we'll sing it out in this song brother Andrew will come and I believe we'll have a time of prayer heavenly sunlight we'll sing all three verses and we'll sing it out on the first walking in sunlight all of my journey over the said I'll never forsake thee promise divine that never can fail heavenly sunlight heavenly sunlight flooding my soul with glory divine hallelujah I am rejoicing singing
Well, all right, we're going to actually open up the altar and have a time of prayer here. Um, if you're risen with us, usually we actually have a, a, our first special of the evening uh, at about this time. But, you know, the Lord really put it on Pastor Gates' heart that, um, you know, if, if God's going to do something here at Liberty Baptist Church, we really need to be a praying people. So we really need to make sure that we're being sensitive uh, to that and, and really putting forth the time, the effort, and laboring in prayer with one another. So um, if you'd like to come and hit the altar, Dale, if you play something, you can come. If you'd like to pray alone, that's fine. If you'd like to pray with a, with a, with a friend, that's great too. But uh, let's get a hold of God tonight. And uh, there's, there's a lot we can pray for. Um, Pastor Gates will be preaching at 10 o'clock, 7 o'clock their time, 10 o'clock our time. And uh, so let's pray for him now. But also if you guys and myself, if we could all uh could remember, um, you know, before you're getting in bed, you know, keep him in prayer. You know, he has a great opportunity. He gets to travel around and and really have an impact on a lot of people's lives. And um, so we, we need to really pray that he's got the power of God on him. And, uh, and we need the power of God on our lives. So let, let's get together and let's get some prayer.
Father, we thank you that we get to meet together, Lord, and we can, Lord, we thank you for your word, and Lord, we thank you that you do hear prayer, Lord. You said, call unto me, and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. And Lord, and you said in your word, now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. And Lord, you told us to pray without ceasing. And, and, and God, we know that you want us to talk to you. You know that we know that you hear our prayers, Lord, and you hear our cries. And God, I pray that you would forgive us, Lord, of any any coldness in our hearts, Lord, as when it comes to our witness. I pray you'd forgive us for that, God. I pray you'd help us to, to to give the gospel many more times than we do. Pray you'd help us not to miss the opportunities, Lord, and pray you'd help us to be sensitive to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. God, I pray that you would just be extra sensitive tonight as to what you would have us get from this service tonight, God. I pray for um, for all the songs that will be sung, Lord. I pray that you would use them to minister to us. I pray for the preaching tonight, God. I pray that you'd use it, Lord. You said you, you chose the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. God, I, I pray that if there's anyone here tonight that's never been saved, never been born again, I pray that, that they would trust Christ tonight, God. And I pray that they would not leave here without being saved. And Lord, for all those outside this church building, God, that can hear, that can hear what goes on tonight, God, I pray that... Um, that the preaching would echo throughout the streets here, Lord, and I pray that there'd be some, some lost soul that would hear it and get saved. God, I pray for Pastor Gates. I pray that you'd be with him. I pray that you'd help to, to give him the right message to preach tonight. I pray that you'd lead him. I pray that your power, Lord, the power of the Holy Spirit would be, would be on him. And I pray that you'd use him, Lord. And we love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, let's uh, let's go ahead and get ready to do our announcements. Um, so if we have any first time visitors here, um, you can meet us in the back at the Welcome Center. We have a gift for you and we'd like you to, uh, we'd like to get a record of your visit, but we're glad that you're here. Again, we're glad for our visitors from Solid Rock Baptist Church, uh, myself and Brother Harrison, our, our sending church, if you will, our, our mother church, if you will. So we, we're definitely glad that you guys are all here. Um, all right. This is one of the most important announcements of the night. Um, the, for the Super Church promotion that we're doing this, uh, this weekend, um, <clears throat> it's going to work out best if we just do it like this. If, if you want to get involved with the giving towards that, um, if you want to either put it in, a, in an envelope and then mark it Super Church or Venmo at Liberty Baptist and then you know put the reason that you're putting that down for, uh, this way we can get all the same nuggets and mac and cheese. I told Brother Harrison before the service, I said, listen, this is a great idea because this way we, we can make sure they're all dino nuggets, right? You've seen the, di the dino nuggets? I know that's what my kids like. I mean, they're, that, that's just cool. If it's not shaped like an animal, then what's the point, right? So um, if you'd like to get involved with that, um, again, just fill out the envelope, Market Super Church or Venmo at Liberty Baptist. If you're too lazy for that, see either Brother Harrison or myself. We'll put it in the envelope, fill it out for you. But um, that'd be a good thing. Okay, sweetest Saturday ever. So we are doing a candy scramble. And so that is coming up quickly. It's going to be, um, we're gonna do it uh, the, the last Super Church before Resurrection Sunday, before Easter Sunday. And so we're going to be over in Fellowship Hall right next door. Uh, many people have already brought in um, a good amount of candy. There's still time to get in on that if you'd like to. Um, it's going to be a great time. And if we can't get kids out you know, to church with a promotion like that, then God help us. But um, I, I do know many young people that are planning to come, and it's going to be a good time. Any, anytime we have these extra little promotions where it's something a little bit extra special, we need to really take advantage of that and really push to, you know, pack the church out and get as many of these kids in here. Um, you know, I was talking to Brother Garrett before the service earlier. You know, he mentioned, you know, he, he's getting married soon. You said how many days? 58? But who's counting, right? Um, you know, his wife, his wife w was, was a bus kid at one point. And, um, you know, just think, just think if, if, if nobody ever cared enough, you know, to give, to pay for the gas and fuel for the, for the buses to go out. And then if no one ever cared enough to serve, to drive the bus and to be a bus worker, go there, invest in, in that young lady's life there. I mean, that's the, a future uh, wife of a pastor right there. 
Um, and keep Brother Garrett in your prayers. You're going to be starting a church. Uh, what, what part of Delaware? Millsboro, Delaware. Millsboro, Delaware. So let's all um, remember Brother Garrett here and keep him in prayer for that. And uh, we know that God loves starting churches. And we need we don't need uh, less church. We need more churches. Specifically, that, that whole northeast corridor, it's been said before, if we lose the northeast, we will lose the country. So it's a big deal. And uh, so we can labor in prayer with Brother Garrett on that. Thank you, JR. All right, who stole the cookie from the cookie jar? I'll tell you what, I know one thing, it wasn't me, all right? I didn't do it, so don't look at me. But uh, this Friday, a junior church, formal dinner and mystery activity. Brother JR, you know, I spent a lot of time with him. I'm around him all the time, and you know, he won't even tell me what the mystery is. I don't even know. So if you want to find out, if you got little ones, then you got to go there uh, this Friday from 6 to 8. And uh, so you can see Brother JR for any additional details about that. All right, so I know of at least two birthdays, at least two birthdays that we have. Um, is, is little Joshua here? No? Okay, he's not feeling well, right? Okay, we'll keep the little guy in prayers. Well, happy birthday to Joshua. We love little Joshua, great young man. And there's someone else, I'm trying to remember, hmm, who, who else had a birthday in here? Does anyone know? Anyone? Oh, Kira, come on up, sweetheart. This is my firstborn. She just turned five years old on March 19th. She loves the starburst, amen. Oh, and a sour punch. There you go. All right, that is a good thing. All right, so that's all for our announcements. Brother Jesse, if you'd come, we're going to have uh, one more song, and we're going to dismiss the little lights. <clears throat> all right, 636, please stand with me if you're able. We'll sing just the first three verses, and then uh, we'll shake some hands for some fellowship, dismiss the little lights for their time upstairs, and we'll sing it out on the first... There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one, no, not one. None else could heal all our souls' diseases. No, not one, no, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will. somebody love them. Liberty, little lights, R is dismissed.
right, let's make our way back to our seats. We're going to jump back in on that fourth verse. Did ever saint find this friend? sticketh closer than a brother. Amen. Amen. All right, so we'll get ready to take up our offering. Uh, So if you'd like to give, that is great. And the Bible says it is more blessed to give than to receive. And uh, so let's pray. Lord, thank you for uh, the opportunity to give, Lord. And I pray that you'd help us to be cheerful givers because you said that you love a cheerful giver, Lord. And I, I pray that you would take it, use it, and multiply it for your glory. God, I pray that you'd help us to be a church that is uh, as involved as possible in supporting more missionaries and helping to start more churches, especially in the Northeast Corridor, Lord. I pray for Brother Garrett, Lord, and, and, and just him, Lord, getting ready to start that church in Delaware. I pray you'd bless him, God. I pray you'd help him with uh, raising any support and just meeting every need that, that he has. And uh, Lord, I pray for pastor again. Lord, I pray you'd fill him with the Holy Ghost. I pray you'd use him greatly tonight. And Lord, we love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to get ready to have a special, and uh, right after that, Brother Justin, you come and you, you bring the word, brother. You preach whatever God gave you. Don't pull any punches, brother, because uh, we need it. But but our people here, we love preaching. Amen. And um, you know, I appreciate Brother Justin. I've I've known Brother Justin since I've been saved, and uh, I got a few men in my life. Um, you know, I'm very passionate about learning the Bible, studying the Bible, and I got a few men in my life that um that I'll go to sometimes with some Bible questions. Brother Justin is one of them. And uh, if you put me and Brother Justin in a room, put, you know, a Bible and some cup of coffee in front of us, we could get, we could get talking for hours. And uh, so I appreciate his heart for the Word of God. And uh, he's, uh, he's the dean over at Vision Baptist College over there, and he has a great opportunity to shepherd um, these, these young people over there, you know, like Brother Garrett, right? You know, men that are getting ready to, you know, enter into full-time Christian ministry. And uh, so he's a blessing in a lot of people's lives and mine. And uh, so we appreciate you being here. All right, so ladies, if you'd come. Thank you. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dale. Thank you for playing, ladies. Thank you for singing. We've got a great God, don't we? Amen. Tell you what, that tore me up. And uh, I love that song. Thank you for putting the title up there. I was already starting to get emotional before I even heard him singing because he put the title up there. Go in your Bible real quick to Micah chapter number 7. And it's amazing sometimes when God just puts some things together. And I'm thankful that God knows the end from the beginning. And... I didn't know that I was for sure going to be able to be out here with you all when Pastor Gates had asked if I would come this way. I spent most of my day today out in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania, and uh, we had a counseling conference that I took a good amount of the college students to, and a lot of our seniors, as well as some of those that are doing their counseling MSA, and and uh, the day started off awful, all right? We were trying to just get out, and nothing would go right. And anybody had those days before? Was anybody else's today? I'm just curious. That mine was, it was just like everything that got bad got worse. And uh, I mean, some comical stuff. I sent, uh, I sent one of the, we didn't have the right amount of vehicles because my numbers were actually incorrect. And, and then I had some people that had to get back for work, which I knew about. So I had some logistics stuff I had to plan. And normally I'm on top of things. And I did not have my details right this morning, and so already feeling like a failure. I'm like, all right, we'll figure it out, you know, and, and I found out very quickly, you know, how weak I am at figuring things out because the Lord sometimes likes to just allow you to realize that you need Him, and, uh, and so I hadn't even really, like, prayed about the actual trip yet at that point, and, you know, I'm figuring out logistics, and I sent some people ahead with my credit card and said, you know, fill up, you know, at the Wawa down on 30, and uh, the one off of Franklin Avenue, for those of you who have any clue what that means, which most of you probably don't, but that's okay, and uh, you can tell this much when I sit down by Franklin Avenue, that was not Franklinville Wawa. Right. So that was completely the other way. And so uh, I was signing it to one man. He understood it. And I spoke it to another man and he didn't understand it. And uh, anyway, long story short, they were going along the other way. And I pulled up into what was supposed to be the right Wawa right there by Franklin Avenue and expecting them to be almost done gassing and me pulling up and they weren't there. And so then we're searching for them on GPS and all of that fun stuff because I had a, a sibling of somebody and they're tracking them and they're like, they're somewhere else. And they said, we're at Mungins. And I said, I said, Wawa, like not Mungins. And so we lost some people in the morning and and then, uh, long story short, that led us to having somebody like, you know, like waving at me at the window there at Wawa. So I realized very quickly I had already taken the keys out, I looked at the window, and I uh, couldn't roll the window down. So I opened the door, and he spoke Spanish. I don't speak Spanish. And so he was saying a lot of whatever, waving his hands. And I was like, you know, staring at him. And then he, like, points at my tire and does this. And I was like flat? He goes, see, sí, see, sí. you know, all right. So we got tongues going on there this morning and had that going on. I don't know any of it. So I looked at the tires. I'm like, that's not too bad, but we'll go check it. You know, maybe this guy knows something I don't know. You know, maybe the tire 
pressure was in Spanish or something. And, you know, so anyway, we went and the machine was broken at Wawa. I couldn't do anything there. And so we drove down the pike, told people where to go. You know, all right, we'll meet eventually in the right direction from wherever you're at. And so went to the next Wawa, pulled in. That one's broken too. Can't get air there. So I thought, surely we're not going to have an issue because, Lord, it's already been rough enough this morning. We're late. Everything's going wrong. I have no idea where those other people are. It's fine. We're going to make it. And so we're kind of cruising along, doing our thing. It's just kind of a rough day, a lot of detours of what was happening. And as we're traveling along, I come up to the next Wawa that I see onto the right, and I think, I'm not stop. We're late. Like, I'm not stopping. And I looked at the tires. They didn't look that bad. And I think we're going to be okay. And then it was just like that, you know, that prompting of the Holy Spirit, like, you should you should not count on your own strength. And at this time, I had prayed, you know, at this point, thankfully. Uh, but uh, anyway, I, I pulled in, and uh, I called Brother TJ. I said, what do you normally put the, you know, the pressure at? And he was like, oh, it's usually around 50. You should be fine. I was like, okay, great. No problem. And I uh, plugged that thing on there. Was it like 20? I was like, ah, I'm glad we stopped. All right. Praise the Lord. And that was good. And so long story short, we made it there and, uh, and had the conference, did what we did. And then when we we're getting ready to leave, came back out and it was low again. I was like, ah, oh. so we waited and worked it out. So I'll probably have a flat by the time we're done, but, uh, it, it, it's been a, an interesting day and say, why did you tell us that story? Because I want to tell you that even in the crazy days, God's still awesome. He's still great. Today did not go the way that I would have anticipated it. I've been looking forward to this time. Honestly, I've been looking forward to this time so much that I didn't really enjoy the conference as much as I would have liked to have, uh, just because this was on my heart. And so I was thinking of this verse even before this song came up, but in Micah chapter number seven, it's not what I'm preaching on. It's just real good. And so brother, brother, um, Andrew said some dangerous things there, you know, like not holding anything back. And so uh, I hope I don't start like crying and preaching because I can't do that very good. Uh, But verse number 18 of Micah 7, if you're there, I know that's kind of a tough one if you aren't used to navigating your Bible there. Uh, But Micah, even if you are, sometimes it's tough. I shouldn't say that. Uh, Micah 7 verse 18 says, Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity clean? And pass, uh, and, excuse me, and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage, he retaineth not his anger forever, because he delighteth in mer- mercy. Verse nineteen: He will turn again; he will have compassion upon us; he will subdue our iniquities, and thou wilt cast all their sins into the depths of the seas. And then go over to Psalm uh, eighty-six, five. Another one, just touching my heart, thinking about this, and Psalm 86, 5 says, For thou, Lord, art good, and ready to forgive, and plenteous in mercy, unto all them that call upon thee. You know, as I come here tonight, I'm honored to be here. I appreciate the fact that I would even get the opportunity to stand behind a pulpit, let alone where a pastor has labored and uh, done a great work in this place. And I've been here before, but I'm, I'm honored and appreciate it. I know Pastor Gates is not here for me to say thank you directly to him, but I appreciate it. And I appreciate those that have labored in this place. And when I say those that have labored in this place, I mean all of you. I understand that, you know, a lot of times what will happen is the person that preaches or the person that sings, a lot of times will get recognition by people. But understand this, that everything you do for the Lord doesn't go unnoticed. And as you're here, you need to be in your place. You need to serve the Lord with gladness. And I want you to understand that you are important. You may not feel important, but you're important to God. And bluntly, you're important to the people at this place. So thank you for being in your place on a, on a Thursday and being where you ought to be. And I understand not everybody could be here tonight, but I'm thankful you're here. And I'm thankful to be here. And so as I, I, I stopped and pondered just this whole idea, I was thinking about the grace of God. There was, when we had this flat tire, I said to somebody, I said, I really need help because i got to get out of here. i got to go preach in Kensington tonight. And they were like, Kensington? You know, I'm over in Valley Forge, right? And so uh, they said they said it kind of like Kensington. And I was like, yeah, Kensington. They're like, have you been there before? And I was like, I have. Like, I have. And so uh, anyway, they were like, they were like, okay, good luck, you know? And I was like, thanks. Praise the Lord. And uh, what was interesting about it is this, is I, I was pumped. I was excited to come here. And bluntly, and this is not to flatter you, but I enjoy coming here. I enjoy being here. And here's why. I think that I'm around people who love God that understand that we're nothing but by the grace of God. You see, what happens sometimes is this. We start getting a big view of ourselves, and it really diminishes our view of God. 
It really does. And it ought to be the other way around. We got a perfect sermon illustration we pulled up here. And uh, Ethan was like, that's a good sermon illustration. But I was trying to pull into the spot. And Brother Andrew was trying to show me how far to scoot up. And so I was parked right out here. And you guys can attest to it because you probably park here every once in a while. And so yeah, he's waving like this. And I'm like trying to look. He's got the sun right behind him. And I'm like trying to look. And he's like waving. I'm like, I'm just going to run to the car in front of me and just say, praise the Lord. And so I, could, I said, I can't see you because all I can see is the sun. And I thought, man, isn't that what we need our life to be like? Just where people can't see us because all they can see is the sun. Say, what are you preaching on? I'm not sure yet, right? So (laughs) we're just having a good time tonight. Uh, But anyway, I was thinking about the forgiveness of God. And, you know, God saved me at a young age. I had the opportunity to get saved at the age of eight. And uh, I grew up not really attending church very much. Uh, my, my parents had divorced when I was about two years old. And uh, it, was, it was something that I don't really remember a lot of. I don't have really any recollection outside of maybe pictures and things people have told me about when my parents had been together. Uh, but I do remember growing up as a kid and seeing the pictures of my parents, uh, you know, wedding and things like that. And, and just the different thoughts that I had through the years of that. I had a stepdad for part of my life. And and uh, bluntly, that, that had gotten divided up as well uh, through divorce and some circumstances when I was a teenager. But even though I went through some difficult times, and I'm not saying it to compare to you, but I'm trying to help you to have a little bit of insight into my life, that uh, realistically, when I look back on my life, there's a lot of things that I wouldn't have really picked to be a part of my story. There are a lot of things that back then I didn't really understand. I I grew up in what would be considered a Catholic home, and we weren't really a practicing Catholic home. My mom had full custody of me, and I didn't really start going to visit my dad until I was about seven or so, and maybe even when I had just turned eight. And and realistically, it was was just one of those things where, you know, I was doing whatever I wanted to do, and my mom is a single mom, and then also having my stepdad, they, they were doing the best they could with what they knew. My dad had been saved, though. My dad was saved before he actually married my mom. And he, and this isn't, a, you know, I, I almost hate telling their story, but uh, I think both of them, if their story could help somebody else, are willing at this point to let me use their story. So I try to be careful with it. I understand that it goes out on the Internet and things like that. But bluntly, my dad had met my mom in sin. And my mom wasn't saved, and, and it, was, it was really a, a, a bad situation. Now, I'm glad I'm here, all right? I'm thankful to be alive. And so, uh, uh, you know, so I, I, I'm glad of the, the result of some of that, but that's not the way that it was supposed to be. But what I found out is in life, sometimes when we do things that we're not supposed to do, or others do things that are even ill will and, you know, having the wrong intent, God can take even things that are meant for wrong and use them for right. And so what's interesting about it is this, is as I was pondering my life and thinking about just the path in which I went, there's a lot of things for me that I didn't understand and bluntly I, I didn't like. Uh, I, I grew up in a, in a small town and went to public school and, and a lot of the people that seemed to kind of be the, you know, the, the good people in church were a lot of times the people that had the opportunity to go to the Christian school and I kind of was a little bit of an outcast is where I was and, and, and I was kind of popular because I was athletic and I would connect with people but realistically I was, I was not like them. I got saved at a young age because I heard the gospel at eight years old in a Sunday school class. And I'm thankful for, you know, we send these kids out and they learn the Bible. And at whatever age they end up understanding and trusting Christ as their Savior, I was one of those kids. But I didn't grow much because I would only go to church every other weekend when I visited my dad. And what had happened was this. I mean, if you only eat two times a month, you're not going to grow very well. And I wasn't growing. I just was a kid that wanted to do what's right. I had the Holy Spirit on the inside, but I didn't even know much about my own salvation. And so realistically, I navigated life and had people guiding me through my life in a lot of different ways. But there was a lot of questions that I had, a lot of hurt that I had, a lot of opinions that I had, a lot of things I didn't understand that were going on in my life. Like even struggling, like, is God always going to continue to love me? Like my parents used to say they loved each other, but they don't love each other anymore. What if, what if God tells me he loves me today, but doesn't love me tomorrow? And there's a lot of weird thinking that I had going on in my head. And then I stopped and thought about it. Wow, the grace of God that He would save me. Out of all the billions of people that are in the world today, God gave me the chance to hear the gospel preached in my language in a book that although I couldn't really read well, I could understand that. And I just by faith trusted Him. And realistically, like I said, there's a lot of things that happened in my life that I wouldn't have wrote in my story. 
But I look back now and I see how God has used a lot of that. I see how God has taught me some things. It's allowed me to go through some hard things because God was going to put some hard people in my path. And although I don't really ever look at people and say, oh, I know what you're feeling, or I know what you, you're thinking, or I know what you experience, because I usually don't. I may understand a little bit, but even people where they've been through the same thing, maybe they've been through a situation where the family's been split, I don't ever look at them and go, I know what you're feeling, because I don't know. But a lot of times I'll say, hey, I would imagine you feel this way because I felt that way. Or I would imagine sometimes you feel this way because I felt that way. But I never say I know what you feel because I don't know. But I know who a God who does. And what's interesting is this, is I've realized the, the more I can get myself out of the way and lead people to Jesus Christ and recognize, hey, we have not a high priest which cannot be touched by the feeling of our infirmities, but in all points he was tempted like as we are yet without sin. What I realized was this, Jesus Christ has felt what you felt. Jesus Christ has experienced what you've experienced. And so, man, I started just thinking about it. Even today as I was pondering this, I was thinking about the goodness of God and the fact that he would forgive me and how awesome that is. Is. And God brought me to the, to the book of Genesis tonight. So I'd like you to go to the beginning of your Bible. And I want you to start with me in Genesis chapter number 37. I don't know everybody's individual story in here. Out of most churches, I would know a good amount of you. And, and some of what is going on in your life, whether it be because of young ambassadors or people that were connected with our church back in the day. So I know bits and pieces of many stories in here. But I don't know what's going on in your heart. I don't know what you've felt. I don't know what's been done to you. I don't know what you've even done to other people. But I do know this, that the forgiveness that God offers is unbelievable. Yeah. It's unimaginable. I mean, the fact that God would love us when we're so unlovely is just beyond me. And so when I'm sitting here and these, these ladies are singing about the idea of I am clean, we don't deserve to be clean. We are not clean in of ourselves. We could wash up with religion and we could wash up with formality and we could even wash up with the best works we could ever do and we'd still be dirty before God. It's only through the blood of Jesus Christ. But when you think about this concept of forgiveness, forgiveness is such a wonderful word when you are the one that is in need of forgiveness. I mean, when you have done wrong, when you have come short, when you have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and somebody says the word like forgiveness, you want to run to the word. You want to embrace the word. When you know you've messed up and somebody even brings up the topic of forgiveness, I mean, you're ready to just grab a hold of any part of it you can. But when you need to give it, that word's not as exciting. Because we really do experience hurt. We really do have regret. We really have been harmed at times. We've had people let us down. We've had people that have come against us. And could I say this to you? There's a lot of people probably in your life that don't deserve your forgiveness. That don't deserve you to even hear their story, to hear their excuse. But could I say this to you, when we needed forgiveness, God didn't have to hear us either. But he was ready to forgive. He was willing to be there. So I want to take you to a dreamer tonight. I want to take you to a man by the name of Joseph. And God starts off the word of God in the book of Genesis. And it's got 50 chapters, and you see man in this wonderful paradise, and it ends with a coffin in Egypt. What an amazing story that God paints here in this. But multiple chapters are dedicated to this man by the name of Joseph. And when you look at Joseph's life, it's an interesting thing because he's a beautiful type of Christ. He's a beautiful picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. But what we're going to see is this. We're going to see a man who was a dreamer, a man who had got a dream even from God. It wasn't just something that he made up on his own. It wasn't just wishful thinking, but this was something where God had revealed a dream to Joseph, and we're going to read it. But then what happens is this. This dreamer begins to talk about it. And he begins to tell his brothers and even his parents what had happened and the dream. And all of a sudden, they didn't really like his dream. And it created some animosity and it created some hatred because realistically he was favored by his father. He had the coat of many colors. Maybe you remember that. And you've heard that story and how he had that. And it was, it was a visible uh, view of the favor he had from his father. By the way, that's not very uh, a smart thing to do if you have multiple children, by the way, to have favorites and to show that. But it happened in this story. 
But this dreamer had these big dreams and they came from God. But what's interesting is you run down the road and you get to the very end of it. Here's what you're going to see. You're going to see the destiny unfold. And this dreamer who believed that God was going to do great things and this dreamer who knew that God was going to take him and put him in a place where he, he, he was lowly and yes, he was favored, but he was, he was despised and rejected by his own brethren. Instead, what was going to happen is down the road, the destination and the destiny was going to be a thing where he was going to be exalted in authority. He's going to be lifted up. But what's going to happen is this. You're going to see the dreamer to the destiny but not without obstacles, not without setbacks, not without detours. Let's look at the Scripture tonight. The Bible says in Genesis chapter number 37, I'll begin reading in verse number 5, And Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. And he said unto them, Here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And behold, your sheaves stood round about and made obeisance to my sheaf. And his brethren said unto him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us? That was their interpretation. Or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. And then he dreamed another dream and told it his brethren and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more and behold the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. And he told his father and to his brethren and to his father, excuse me, and his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee in the earth or to the earth? And his brethren envied him, but his father observed the sayings. See, this dreamer had a dream. And I'm going to take you right to the end of the story. And the end of the story, I want you to, I want you to look at this. It's not the total end of the story, but I want you to see further down the road. Look at, look at Genesis chapter number 42. Jump ahead a little bit. And in Genesis chapter number 42, I'll begin reading in verse number 6, and I'll skip over another chapter here, but look at this. In verse number 6, the Bible says, And Joseph was the governor over the land. And he it was that sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brethren came and bowed themselves before him with their faces to the earth. And Joseph saw his brethren, and he knew them. But he made himself a stranger unto them, and spake roughly unto them, and said unto them, Whence come ye? And they said, From the land of Canaan to buy food. And Joseph knew his brethren, but they knew him not. And look at this. And Joseph remembered the dreams, plural, the dreams which he dreamed of them. And then you can jump ahead in, in chapter number 43, verse number 26. And when Joseph came home and they brought him the uh, present which was in their hand into the house and bowed themselves to the earth, they bowed to him and then he asked of them their welfare. And he said, Is your father well, the old man of whom you speak? Is he yet alive? And they answered, Thy servant our father is in good health, and he is yet alive. And they bowed down their heads and made obeisance. You see, Joseph had a dream. Joseph's dream was that God was going to do something great with him. There's been times in my life where I've dreamed. Not a dream from God in that I, I had some prophetical thing happen like happened in Joseph's life. But I'm talking about there have been some times where I've truly tried to just get alone with God and say, God, what could you do with my life? God, you, you, you love me enough to save me and you love me even more not to let me stay the same. What could you do with my life? And as I began to ponder those things of what God could do with a life, there are some things that God has put in my heart and in my mind and I'd love to see God do. But what I found out is just like in Joseph's life, you don't go from the dream to the destiny without some detours. Because if, if Joseph would have been able to write the story from his dream to the destiny, there's a lot of places he never would have went. There's a lot of things he never would have experienced. And tonight I want to deal specifically with one or two major things that are kind of like roadblocks on your route to your destiny. 
And the major one is going to be this, forgiveness. Forgiveness. You see, we love the fact that God forgave us. Yet my question is this, who does God want you to forgive? Who does God want you to forgive? Lord, I pray that you bless tonight and help me to communicate clearly these thoughts here from the Word of God. Lord, I need your power. I need your strength. This is not something that I even feel adequate to be able to speak on fully. God, every day I try to understand you better and understand your word better. And God, I know this, you're ready to forgive. And God, so many times I'm not. I pray that you would forgive me for my lack of readiness. God, would you help me to convey truth? Lord, I don't stand before these people as someone who's got it all together, someone who's done this perfectly. God, I feel so inadequate. But God, I know that your word is clear and your word is true. And we ought to be ready to forgive. God, I can't imagine some of the hurt that people have felt in this room. And maybe even those that would hear this on the audio or recording later, God, that you would speak to hearts. God, you know who will hear this. Would you help us to be ready to forgive? Lord, would you please help us to represent you well to this lost and dying world? We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Bluntly, life is filled with unexpected turns. I don't know about you, but there's been times that I've traveled around, and just like this morning, thought we were going one way and had to go another way. We almost made it today to 295, and as I came up to 295 and was ready to work my way over across and go through Philadelphia and then get out to Valley Forge, there was a detour that I had to take, and this one didn't have any signs. It was a recent accident, so I'm pulling up my GPS real fast. I'm trying to see, and I'm thinking, if I can make it right here, and I can just get down to good old moldy road, I'll get out of here. And uh, I was looking around, and sure enough, we went there, and we made the left. We went down and got past the, the, the part where it was blocked off, and I thought, wow, praise God, we didn't get stuck in another setback. But that was a detour. It, was, it wasn't something I was expecting to take. If you said, you know, Brother Justin, on your way over to Valley Forge, are you going to go this way and that way and that way? I say, absolutely not. And bluntly, could I say this? There are some things that because of your decisions, you made some, some detours in your life. There have been some times where you didn't think you were going to go that route. And there were times that it was because of your own doing and your own decision making or your lack of decision making. And you've gone down some roads you didn't expect to go. By the way, sometimes those roads aren't always a bad thing. Sometimes there's these insights that you may gain, and sometimes you might even feel like, man, that was a good thing. I took the scenic route. Anybody ever used that excuse before? Man, that was good. I took the scenic route. I got to see something different. You try to make the best of your situation. But can I say this to you? I understand that living in 2024, I can't even believe I'm saying it, but while you're living in 2024, there are some detours that don't feel comfortable. There are some things that you didn't put in your script. There are some things you didn't expect to happen. Hey, you may have thought, hey, dabbling in this was going to maybe hurt me a little bit, but I didn't think it was going to hurt me to this extent. Or maybe you thought, hey, I was going to go down this path, but I was going to stop before it got too bad. Or maybe you thought, hey, I'll get him involved with this person and you know we're not going to let it get out of hand and what happens is this is life begins to take place and sin grips hold of you and sin when it is finished bring it forth death and in life we have so many times we have regrets I'm sure that I'm not the only person in this room that has regrets and there's things I wish I could go back and I could do it again and sometimes by our own decision making sometimes it's the decisions of others that impact our life I recognize that a lot of the decisions that I make in my life will directly impact my four daughters. It will directly impact my wife. It will directly impact Solid Rock Baptist Church and Vision Baptist College and Young Ambassadors for Christ. I understand that even the decisions that I make in my life will greatly influence a generation. Not because I'm great, but because God has allowed me to be in a place where my decisions are not going to just affect me. But I want you to understand, it's not because I have a platform. It's not because I'm the preacher. But your decisions will not stop at you. It will not stop at you. There are so many people today that make their decisions because they feel like, hey, it's only me that's involved in this. It's only going to hurt me. But a lot of times they don't see that crying and weeping mama who's praying for them, wishing they wouldn't go down that path. But I want you to understand that we live in a day where so much regret takes place. My challenge would be this. You need to learn the real concept of forgiveness. But there's a lot of mistakes that happen in the area of forgiveness. Sometimes people think forgiveness means things that it really doesn't mean. 
I wrote some of these down just to kind of get us started here. Sometimes people think that forgiveness means that you're going to forget something that took place. I want you to understand that people telling you to forgive and forget is some of the dumbest advice I've ever heard. I sure wish there were some things that I could forget. I I wish there were some things. And you know, Paul even challenges us to forget the things that are behind. You know what that means? It doesn't happen easy. And by the way, when he was talking about forgetting the things which were behind, it wasn't just the bad things. It was the good and the bad things because he was pressing toward the mark. He was going on and he wasn't going to let the things that had happened before stop him. But you know what he was going to do? He was going to deal with them biblically. You see, he wasn't going to deal with misunderstandings like forgiveness means that I've got to forget. Listen, there are some things that you are never going to forget, but God, by the grace of God, can help you to remember them no more. And I don't know if you understand fully what I mean by that, but I've got a God who knows all things that chooses to remember my sin no more. It's not because He doesn't know. It's not because He doesn't have the capacity. It's because He's chosen not to bring them up again. And I thank God that, 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 hey, we need to understand forgiveness correctly. And one major mistake is this, is people think that you're going to have to forgive and forget. But that's not really the case. Instead, forgiveness means that the offender is no longer held accountable in your court. You see, when you forgive somebody, what you're doing is this. You're saying, I'm taking this this offense and I'm putting it to a higher court. God, you're handling this. And the reason why I say that is this, is because there's a lot of people today that think that if you forgive somebody, you have now said what they did was okay. And that's not true. It's a misunderstanding about forgiveness, thinking that what if I forgive that person, then ultimately what I'm saying is when they hurt me, or when they hurt my sibling, or when they hurt my mom, or when they hurt my family, or when they did this, now I'm okaying it. It's not okay. Forgiveness is you saying it's no longer being judged at my court. It's going to another court, and it's God's court. And the Bible says this, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. And I want you to understand that when you forgive somebody, you say, hey, it's no longer here, it's you and God. And I want you to understand that when you give it up to the court, at God's court, God takes care of it the right way. Now, I'm thankful that my my sins were judged at the cross of Calvary. I'm giving you a a lot of meat right now, but I want you to get kind of the concept that I'm giving you. You see, I, I've been studying the book of Romans, and man, it's a deep book, but it's a, it's a wonderful book. And uh, recently, I, I, I had done a study about the forbearance and the patience and the long-suffering of God. And, and sometimes we don't really know how to, to, to dissect the idea of long-suffering and forbearance. We don't usually use the term forbearance a lot in our communication. But here's what forbearance means. When we do wrong, God has the ability and the authority to judge our wrongdoing immediately. Is that correct? Do you understand that? When we do wrong, God can judge it right there and immediately. He's got the right to, got the authority to, He can do that. However, His forbearance says this, I know I have the right to do it, but I will forbear and choose to withhold that punishment, and he withholds that, and his long suffering is the patience in it, but the withholding is the forbearance, and here's why. Because there were a lot of people who did some wrong things that he allowed the blood of bulls and goats to, here's what it was, bring remission, and here's what it was. It was forgiveness for the time being, saying, hey, it's not going to be judged right here, but it will be judged. And what he said was this, it's not going to be judged right now because here's what's going to happen. This innocent is going to die and there's going to be remission of sins. There's going to be forgiveness here, but it's not going to be taken away until the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And the four parents of God said, I'm not going to exercise that judgment right now because one day those that trust my son, I'm putting it on him. And that was the forbearance of God, the patience of God, the long-suffering of God. Think about it. God let you stay alive long enough to get saved. That's the forbearance of God. You deserved and I deserved to split hell wide open, but God didn't judge us when He could have judged us. Instead, in forbearance, He was willing to wait and withhold that. And here's what it is. If you got saved, He put that on His Son. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. How amazing is that? Yet, we have a responsibility to forgive like God forgives. Yet, we don't, we, we're not afforded the same abilities. We don't have the same attributes. 
Oh, yes, there are similarities and there are things that are helpful. We're all dinging and, and binging and what do we got here? And everybody got a message at the same time. That's what happens in college chapel too. We've got group messages and sometimes somebody will send it while I'm preaching. It's like ding, 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 ding. I'm like, hey. All right, celebrating right there. So here's what it is, right? God in his forbearance withholds that judgment. But be not deceived, God is not mocked. What sort of man soweth, that shall he also reap. God will judge sin. The Bible says that those that sin actually store up for themselves wrath for the day of judgment. So those that, that their sins aren't judged on Christ, down the road they will have their store, their treasure of wrath that's going to be poured out on them because of their sin. You die in your sins, you'll pay for your sins. So we're dealing with forgiveness. When you forgive somebody, you're putting it to a higher court and you're saying, God, you deal with it. It's not at my court anymore. By the way, if you keep it in your court, you might keep it out of God's court. You might keep it out of God's court. And what I mean by that is this. Just like, you know, if, if you have, if you, God talks about, you know, if you have your praise of men, you have your reward. Same idea. If we harbor vengeance, then God doesn't take vengeance. So forgiveness is you saying, I'm going to choose to believe what's right. Because in this detour that I didn't want, I didn't ask for, but you did to me, I'm going to understand that this, God can take and use it for good. So there's some misunderstandings. I've given you a couple there. I'll give you a few more. Another misunderstanding is this. You're, you're not truly, you've not truly forgiven someone if you still feel hurt. That's a lie. Or it's a misunderstanding. You understand healing is not the same as forgiveness. Trust is not the same as forgiveness. Sometimes people feel like, oh, man, if I forgive somebody, then now I have to trust them. Listen, if you just stole $20 from me, I'm not letting you hold my wallet. I can forgive you, say, good luck with the 20 bucks," or like, hey, be nice if you give it back because like, I'd like to eat this week, but I'm not going to be like, yo, hold my wallet now. There's a difference between forgiving someone and saying, I'm not going to hold it against you, and then also developing trust. See, what's awesome about God is this. He knows our heart. So when we say, God, I am so wrong, please forgive me. What I did, I shouldn't have said it. Uh, my, my attitude was terrible. My thoughts were terrible. My behavior was terrible. God, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. The Bible says that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Like that. You know what He has the benefit of knowing? Your heart. When we go against each other and we mess up and I let a brother down or I let a sister down and I mess something up, guess what happens? You don't know my heart. So I can say all I want, but guess what? Forgiveness and reconciliation are not the same thing. Yeah, that's right. They are different. And I believe they're both important, but one of them requires one person. The other, the other part requires the help of two people yeah. or more. You see, it doesn't take someone else to be involved in you forgiving. Right. You choose to forgive or not. That's right. Reconciliation is different because there's got to be an agreement and a coming together and a rejoining in reconciliation. And so what happens is this. We kind of blend and merge these things together and we think like, oh, well, somebody said they're sorry, so now i got to let them walk all over me. No, you don't. No, you don't. There are people that are in abusive relationships and it's like they said sorry and I feel, I'm a Christian so I have to forgive them and then I'm just going to get walked all over in an abusive relationship. That's not what the Bible says. It says make no friends with an angry man. Hey, there's principles out there that you ought not to be in those types. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Hey, there are different principles in the Word of God. Forgiveness is not just you letting people walk all over you. So we need to understand these things biblically, and here's why. We would love to be the ones with the dreamer, and, and man, God's got plans, and what could God do in this city if, if we really got on fire for God and just started seeking God and, and just praying, saying, God, use me. Help me to be a witness. Help me to be a testimony. Help me to glorify your name. When I'm working, when I'm walking, when I'm doing whatever I'm doing, God, I just want you to be lifted up and use this church and use me. God could do a great work, but you're going to take some detours. Some of them are going to be your missteps. Some of them are be your mistakes. And some of them are going to be mistakes of other people. Some of them are just going to be situation because life happens. You understand that sometimes you're just going to face difficult things because we live in a fallen world. We live in a world that's riddled by sin. I mean, you guys are, you guys are living in you know, the bad lands. And it's here and everybody's like, oh man, that's so bad. But you want to know what's crazy? It's just more visible here. You understand people are just as wicked everywhere else. It just may not be as visible at times. 
And what we got to understand is this, is God loved us when we were unlovely. And we can't love Him the same way He loves us. We can't. Oh, we're commanded to. But you ever wondered why Jesus, when He got... You know how people try to trick Jesus and they try to do that? And Jesus is way smarter than them because He knows everything. Like, that's pretty advantageous. But they said, Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? What's the greatest commandment? And he says, well, the first is the greatest. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and mind. And then he throws in, and the second's like the first. And you're kind of like, oh, they asked which one. And so he puts in two because he can. Good luck with that argument. But he can. But I've pondered that. A lot of times when I read something, I try to find out why. Anybody else like that where it's just like, my, my kids are like that. Why, why, why? You know, it's like, because I said so, leave me alone. Right? And so here's what it is. We're supposed to love God like He loves us, but we can't do it. You know why? Because we can't love Him when He's unlovely. Because He never is. You can't. Much as you want to, you can't. Because He never fits the bill. You can't love Him when He's unlovely. And that's why He said, but the second is like the first. Love your neighbor as yourself. You see, you get to exercise that full understanding of love by loving those that are unlovely. You know what love does? It covers a multitude of sins. You know what love does? Love forgives. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is tender. God gives us this understanding of what this real forgiveness and love is like. So let's go back to our story. Can I, can I just kind of move you through the story? Because I think most of you would know the story. If you look at a life and say, I want to pattern my life after someone, you wouldn't mind patterning it after the tail end of Joseph's life. And you, you, some of you might hear, might, might be kind of that, like, you know, not afraid of a little bit of fight in you. Anybody in here, you know, not afraid of a little bit of fight? Where it's like, hey, I was the favored kid. Everybody hated it, but bring it on. Maybe you would have liked the beginning of Joseph's story. Maybe. Maybe a little, little edge to you. Kicking the pulpit now. So most of us, we like the tail end. Oh, leader. I mean, high up. Ruling, interpreting dreams, doing the amazing things, hearing from God, plenteous, stored up, help. Everybody now needs you because you're there. I mean, you're the big name. I mean, the only person hiring you is Pharaoh. I mean, you're up there. We'll take that story. But you think about his story, what happened? He's there with his father. He's favored. He's got it going on. He begins to talk about the dreams. And these weren't lies. These weren't made up. This was real. And all of a sudden, God begins to reveal this and show this. And now he begins to talk about it. And people begin to despise him. And his dad's kind of keeping it in his heart thinking, man, that's an interesting thing. And you think about it, his mom had died. And so a lot of the interpretation was like the, you know, the mom and the dad were going to be the, the, the sun and the moon. But it really couldn't have been that. There's probably more to that story. You might want to look that up. Because she wasn't even going to be there to bow down. And the father never did bow down. Interesting. But we did know that the brothers, they were going to bow down. And they did. So I don't even know if they fully understood what was happening, but that was their interpretation that we read. And what happens is this. We see it all begin to unfold, but check this out. You know what they did? They said, you know what? We don't really like this guy. Why don't we just get rid of him? We're tired of seeing him with that fancy coat. They despised him. They just hated how, how he was blessed. Man, that hatred in their heart later on in the New Testament, we find that's just like murder. And look what it led them to. We're going to kill this guy. They throw him in a pit. They think, ah, maybe we shouldn't leave him in there. Here's what we'll do. They heard people talking. Ah, oh, we'll sell him to them. So they were sold into slavery. He ends up in Potiphar's house. He's a servant. He's trying to do what's right. God, he, he's so right with God in bondage as a slave that God begins to bless Potiphar's house because Joseph's there. That's pretty cool. But I wouldn't want to be in bondage. That's pretty cool. But I wouldn't want to be in that situation. And it wasn't without his temptations. He's there and he's doing what he's supposed to do. And then a lady decides to show up and start kind of giving him some, some problems. And Potiphar's wife comes and approaches him and begins to open up this temptation. And, and again, a picture of Jesus. There's so many of them. We're constantly tempted and tempted. And thank God that Jesus was without sin. And so you see the situation here where, you know, she's coming at him. And then one of the days it happens to be where nobody else is there and he's there to do his business. And she grabs a hold of him and he flees. And there's so many principles you can pull out there. You know, you, you resist, you resist, but eventually you just flee. Get out of there. And she kept that code and she lied to her husband. 
And J Joseph had already said, he said, my, your husband's given me everything but you. You are not for me. You're for him alone. And she lied. And sure enough, the husband believes her. I'm sure in his heart of hearts knew. <laughs> but believes her. And now he goes to prison. He's wrongfully accused. He's framed. He's lied about. He's done nothing but right. He spoke about what God spoke to him about. He was left for dead. He was lied about. He was put in prison. And now he's in the prison for a couple years. And then you got the baker and the butler, and they show up. What's interesting is this. You see a beautiful picture as well for the Christian life. This is just extra for you to study later. He's in prison, and he's serving the prisoners. It's kind of like this. You know, we're in this life, and we become a servant of Christ. And that really does mean the idea of being in, in service or, you know, a slave. We don't like that because it's such a derogatory term most times. But it's the idea of, like, I'm serving Christ. I'm in bondage to Christ. But there's liberty in Christ. And what it is is this, is I'm bound to him just like you would have that bound in a marriage. But I serve others. And he was there running the prison while he's in prison. I don't know about you, but I'd be going, God, have you forgotten about me? My God, I had the dream. You told me, you told me this is all going to work out. God, you, you told me, you showed me the end. How, how far away is it? Do you hear me, God? I don't know. Like, see, sometimes because we know the end of the story, we forget like all the feelings he would have felt the whole way through. You ever felt hurt? You ever felt wronged? You ever almost felt like it was God that did it to you? I have. I have. I like to fix things. Not really. I just hate it when things break, and then I end up being the one that has to fix them. So I guess I should reword that. I've found in my life that I have to fix a lot of things. That would be the right way to say it. I remember that uh, after we had our two children, Briar and Thea, my wife and I had experienced a miscarriage on our third child. We had never had one before, and I know that that's not an uncommon thing, and people have experienced that before. But for one of the first times in my life, in my married life anyway, I was, I was at a crossroads of something I couldn't fix. My wife felt things that I didn't feel. She hurt in ways that I didn't hurt. I couldn't say anything to make it better. Couldn't go back and solve it. I couldn't promise anything in the future. Heaven. But I really, I felt helpless. And I won't say that I got angry with God, because it's really not true. But I had some questions. Because God had been so kind to me, I forgot what it felt like to hurt like that. And I asked some hard questions, and I tried to ask it in the right way. But I don't know what you felt. And I don't know what you've experienced. But has there been some times in your life where you almost wonder, like, God, did you forget about me? Like, God, do you even know what I'm going through? God, do you even know what's being said about me? Do you even know what they did? And maybe you felt those feelings. I'm sure Joseph felt some of those things. What's amazing is this. I think that even though he probably felt those things, he responded correctly. But you think about it. He said this. He interpreted the dreams of the baker and the butler, and he said, remember me. Remember me. The baker's gone, and the butler goes back, and time goes on, and does he remember him? No. It's like, man, you feel like you're let down by God, but you weren't. But you feel like it. And then you feel like you're let down by people. And maybe you were. I mean, why in the world did he remember that? That guy gave you the interpretation of the dream and you got out of prison and you forgot? Are you serious? That's some crazy stuff. So he hits detour, 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 detour. And he's sitting in prison doing what he's doing. How's the dream, Joseph? How's the dream? Maybe he was, you think he was mad at anybody? Think he was mad at his brothers? He wouldn't be there if they wouldn't have thrown him in the pit. 
He wouldn't be there if they wouldn't have sold him to slavery. If anybody had a right to complain and be upset and not forgive, <laughs> I would have looked at Joseph and been like, that's the guy. Like, he didn't deserve all that. I mean, it would have been something different if he was like bragging about something that like, wasn't even true, but this was what God gave him. And so then here's what happens. Pharaoh has the dream. Then all of a sudden it's like, aha, there's this guy that can interpret your dream. He comes, he interprets the dream, all this happens. God exalts him, he puts him in this situation. They get all the, the, the grain for the seven years of plenty and they save it and they do what they're doing. And then now the people have to come to them in the seven years of famine and they've got to come to them. And now his brethren show up. And we read this in the scriptures. And it all comes full circle. And they come and they bow down. And he says that he makes himself like a stranger. He knew them, but they didn't know him. I think he was faced with a big decision. I had a situation that, uh, I'm trying to think how I can say it tactfully. I got into a situation that turned into a physical altercation when I was a teenager. Somebody was in my house involving my family, and it wasn't a good situation. I... I wear contacts, and so usually when I go to bed, if I'm not lazy by keeping my contacts in, which I don't suggest you do, but I usually would then wear glasses. That night, I had my glasses uh, there by my bed. I got woken up, and I exited my room out of anger to stop someone in my home, and I went out very quickly to realize I didn't have my glasses or my contacts on, so that was a problem, so I... Got into a little bit of a physical altercation there as a teenager, um, uh, removing somebody from my home. And uh, it was a bad situation. I said a lot of things that night, and a lot of things were said to me, and it was an ugly night. Uh, it was maybe three and a half, four years later. Uh, I was delivering pizzas as a way to make money to be able to get back to Bible college, and I delivered pizza to that man. <laughs> I don't know if you ever knocked on the door. I'm bringing pizza. I knock on the door and open up, and I was like... Hey, you look a little different when I got my contacts in. Um, and I thought in my mind, I can still take this guy. Anyway, uh, open up that door. I had a lot of feelings by seeing somebody face to face like that. And could I say this to you? There's going to be times where you have situations, feelings, people, smells, experiences. And they will like, here's the word, trigger. They'll, they'll, they'll make you think things. They'll make you go back in your mind. They'll make things happen. And you're faced with a decision. I want to explain this to you. One of the best things you can learn to do is to forgive. And here's what's awesome. Forgiveness is something that you have the power to do. Reconciliation is something you ought to strive for. And what I mean by that is this. It doesn't take anyone else for you to forgive. If you've been wronged and something's happened against you that shouldn't have happened, you can choose to forgive. You're not condoning it. You're not saying it's okay. You're not now all of a sudden trusting that person. You are saying, this is not my battle. Your debt is not with me. I gave it to God, and you do right to the person. However, reconciliation is different. Your healing process is different. So you may still hurt. There's a process for that. Reconciliation is when you try to bring things back together. For example, here was the illustration with Christ. I know I'm a little bit more teachy right now. It's just such a weighty thing. I hope you're getting this. What happens is this is, you know, we were strangers and aliens away from God, meaning we had no right, no connection to God. But because of Jesus Christ, he brings us back together. We were his because he created us. But because of our sin, we're separated from God. Reconciliation is the fact that he didn't just forgive us and say, hey, it's good, you're fine, see you later. He brought us back together. The goal is always reconciliation. But understand this, God never commands reconciliation with a party that's not willing to reconcile. Even salvation alone isn't the fact that Jesus died. That was forgiveness. He forgave, not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. That, that's why he died. He was willing to forgive all. But the reconciliation is when we do something with it. Repentance brings the reconciliation. So here's what I want to show you. If you've done wrong, you have a responsibility to do your part on the reconciliation. 
And one of the guys earlier when we were talking about it said, what about restoration? Restoration is when you put back things that were lost, if you can do that, sometimes even above and beyond what was lost, if it's something that's replaceable, and that's a part of your reconciliation. But what happens is this, is sometimes people have pointed their finger at me and been like, you're the Christian, you need to forgive, why don't you trust me? And I'm like, hold on a second, I did forgive you, but I don't trust you. I did forgive you, but you can't force reconciliation on me. You're not even sad that you did it, and I still forgave you. That's not like, oh, I'm great. That's me knowing the Bible. I'm not a great example because I did it. It's me knowing the Bible. And so what, what, what Joseph did here was this, is he saw them, and guess what? He tested them. He tested them. Say, oh, that's wrong. You shouldn't test somebody to see if they're serious. For reconciliation, you do. For reconciliation, you do. Because that's why the Bible says we have to bring fruits, meat for repentance. So if you're trying to bring a relationship back together, you need to do something about it. And it's not going to be brought back together if the people involved both don't do something about it. You can forgive. You can drop the charges and say, hey, I love you. But God knows all about what happened. I wish we could be tight again. I wish we could be close again. But I can't do that unless we're willing to work together. And by the way, you can find out a lot about what people want by this, right? If the person's willing to tell everybody except for the people involved, they don't want forgiveness and they don't want reconciliation. They want vengeance. If the person goes to everybody except for the person actually involved, they're not looking for forgiveness. They're not looking for reconciliation. They want vengeance. They want you to hurt like they hurt. So if people begin to gossip about whatever and tell you the story, by the way, understand this. The first thing you should do is say this. Have you talked to them about it? Have you spoken to them about it? Don't bring me into this because it's, the, the, the judgment's not for me. But instead, people want to gather rebels, raise armies. They start bringing people in. And, oh, did you hear? Did you hear? Did you hear? Here, you've got to be on my side. You've got to be on my part. You've got to hear this because so-and-so did this. I had something happen to me recently. It was so comical. I think I told some of the people that were here already because I had preached chapel. But I took a phone call some months ago. And it was an interesting phone call. I picked up the phone, and usually when people call me, they usually reference my name. And uh, they said, hey, Brother Justin. Or no, they didn't say Brother Justin. They said, hey, Justin. I said, hey, how you doing? And usually when that happens, like, we begin to, like, have a conversation. You know, if you call me, like, hey, Justin, I say, hey, back. We start talking. And then they're like, you're not going to believe this. I'm like, what? You know, I'm like, ready? What? And they said, oh, Barnett. And they spoke about me like in a third-person sense. It just sounded strange. So I was like, huh? And they began to just rail on me. I can't believe he did this, and he did that, and I, I looked up his stuff, and he's got this, and he did that, and started all about my business, just dumping out there. I th it was it, a friend of mine, so I thought they were kind of messing with me at first. Like, literally, they'd just been in my house the day before. Day before. And I was like, I said, what? He goes, there's more. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, no. <laughs> and he's like, yeah. <laughs> and he's just going on, just crushing me. And he goes, what do you think about all that? And I said, it makes my heart hurt. He said, what do you mean it makes your heart hurt? I said, you called Justin Barnett. He goes, Barnett? Oh. I said, yeah, you called the wrong Justin. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> that really happened. So then it was like, oh, well, I think, I think it was a good thing that I called you. <laughs> I was like, you think? You think? You think it was a good thing? All right. So now I'm crying, and I'm on the phone, and I got church in an hour or two, and I'm like, what in the world? So we have a conversation. We end up meeting in church and having a conversation, whatever, and, you know, he felt like he ate crow, if whatever that means. I don't really try to eat crow, but he felt like he did that, and, you know, all this stuff happened, and I said, man, I forgive you. And so I think he thought I was going to go tell everybody, you know, what happened. And bluntly, I didn't tell anybody. He, at one point, spoke to my father-in-law, who's in our church, and told him the story. My father-in-law didn't even know the story. And, and, you know, he had said to me, he's like, I don't care who you tell. I said, I don't need to tell anybody. And so I'm not going to obviously give you, well, what's his name? I'm not going to give you his name, right? <laughs> you want to know. Shame on you. But here's what it is. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You know why? What I learned was this. I learned what was right, and I learned a lesson from it. Number one, don't call the wrong person if you're going to gossip. <laughs> Number two, like I've learned in ministry, sometimes you're going to feel like the knife in your back. 
and this is a really like grotesque. I apologize for being crude about it. It's almost like you just want to pull it out, wipe it off, and say you forgot your knife. I know that's really gross, but realistically, what what am, what am I going to say? Like, am I really going to make an enemy over it? If he learns from this and realizes, and we've talked multiple times since, and like he even came to my house another time, and and uh, you know, and it just was—it's a funny situation. And I, honestly, I'm I'm still friends, and it is what it is, and it, it it hurt, it hurt, it really did. What he said wasn't fair. It wasn't even co- completely correct. I said, "Would you like me to tell you the answers of the things you brought up?" And he was like, "No, nah, not really." I said, "Well, then you didn't really want to know." You know, I'm starting to grill him, and so I let it go. I still remember it. It's actually a comical story. It's a fantastic illustration now. But I look back and I go, what in the world? Because it did. It hurt. Let me ask you this. On things way more severe, and sometimes even less and more trivial than that, right? We don't forgive. So if you're on the part where you've wronged somebody, understand that you saying sorry isn't good enough. Reconciliation is when you go to make it right. I'll tell you this last thing and I'll be done. Raise, am, I, am I okay? Should I be done now? Can I tell this story? All right. Brother Andrew said, you better behave up there. So here's what it is, right? And I'll be done. I'm raising my children. I'm trying to teach them as best I can about God. How many in here are you raising kids in some way, shape, or form here, right? A lot of you. Okay. <sighs> Miss Heather's still working on it. I know. I know. <laughs> so... I'm discipling another man, by the way, named Justin. Not connected to the story, thankfully. But I'm discipling a, a man by the name of Justin, who I would normally be discipling tonight. We, we weren't able to connect, obviously. But he's going through a situation. He's trying to raise his kids. He recently got saved. His, his wife had gotten saved before, but uh, lightly grounded. She knows, she knows her way around the scriptures and things like that. But they're growing, and they're raising their kids. And he mentioned to me that uh, when his kids got in trouble, the way they had handled it in their home, and this isn't to embarrass him, he's grown since and it is what it is, but uh, similar to his upbringing, when he got in trouble, he was told, get out of here, get out of here. I guess he grew up in a family where it was primarily boys, and basically they were just constantly being told, get out of the house, because you know, if you're out of the house, at least we don't have to hear you cause the ruckus, right? And get out, get out, get out. And I told him, I said, Justin, obviously you have to lead your home, I said, but I'm going to tell you something that we've tried to do, and I'm not by any means telling you that I know everything about raising children. Trust me, I don't. I said, but one thing that we're doing is this. I said, if you were to come into my home and one of my two older girls, because they're the only ones that can really communicate at this point. The twins aren't old enough to do that yet, but um, and they do like to really fight. It's pretty cool if you ever want to see something crazy. But anyway, the, the older two, what will happen is this. If one does something wrong to the other one, I'll, I'll say to Briar, I'll say to Thea, vice versa, I'll say, I'll say what do you say? What do you say? What do you say to your sister? And she'll say, I'm sorry for this, I'm sorry for that. And without me saying anything else, here's what the other one says every time. I forgive you. Every time. You know, some of the hardest words for me to say is I was wrong. Some of the hardest words for me to say is please forgive me. Because I'm acknowledging that I messed up and I hate failing. I hate messing up. I hate it. So there's some of the hardest words because it's so humbling. I've looked my daughters in the eyes. I've looked my wife in the eyes and said, I was wrong. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I've, I've looked in my daughter's eyes and had them look back at me. Little Thea say, I forgive you, Daddy. Briar look at me and say, I forgive you, Daddy. And we hug and it's over. And man, they, sometimes they get their discipline. You can figure that out. I kind of gave you a little visual there, right? They'll get their discipline. But you know what's interesting is every time they're getting their discipline, we always end in a reconciliation. I don't send them away. I bring them to me. And he said, Justin, I never thought about that. He said, you see, Justin, what you told me was helpful because I keep sending my son away, and I want him to run to me. I want to teach him to run to me. You know what we do a lot of times? We get hurt. We push away. 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 And I want you to understand. The father said, come. Come. Maybe you got something tonight you need to get right with God. Would you come? Maybe there's something you need to get right with somebody else. Would you go? Would you do your part? Maybe, here's what it is, you're holding on to something where you need to forgive. You understand, forgiveness doesn't free the other person. It frees you. It frees you. You don't have to bear it anymore. It goes into God's court. You can free yourself. 
Forgiveness isn't for the other person. Forgiveness is for you. Reconciliation is how you put that back together again. So you look at Joseph, dreamer to the destiny with a lot of detours. Hey, your life isn't the way you thought it was going to be, I guarantee. There's been some things that have happened. There have been some choices you've made, some hurt you've felt. What are you going to do about it tonight? Are you ready to forgive? Are you ready? We need to forgive because Christ forgave us. But also, what do you need to reconcile? We need to put back together again. Lord, I pray you bless this invitation time. God, I did not preach the gospel, but I would mentioned your forgiveness. I'm so thankful for the forgiveness of our sins that offered through Jesus Christ. If there's anyone that doesn't know you tonight as Savior, I pray that they would start there and receive the forgiveness of sins. Thank you for paying for our sin debt, dying on the cross for our sins. Lord, I pray you bless this invitation. What a humble thing it is that we could come before you and know that we can be clean, we can be right. But God, I pray that you'd help us to represent you well, to not withhold forgiveness for our own sake. But God, I pray that you'd help us to seek to give forgiveness, to be ready to forgive like you are. And Lord, I pray that you help us to heal. Help those that are genuinely hurting God. Help them be on the path of healing. Lord, help them to run to your arms, that you're the comforter. Thank you for the Holy Spirit who comforts us and helps us and comes alongside of us. God, thank you for that. Thank you for being a solution when there is no solution. Lord, we look to you tonight. Would you help us to go maybe from the dreamer to the destiny, but recognize that some of these detours really teach us more about you. Thank you for Joseph's example who reconciled after this testing to his brothers. And when they thought harm was going to come, instead he was kind and he said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Lord, I know that we've experienced some things, but would you take and use it for your good? Lord, we claim this verse that we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them that are the called according to His purpose. God, help us to love you with all our hearts. Help us to be like you. And Lord, would you mend some relationships tonight? Would you bring families together again? Would you bring friends together again? Would you bring a church family together? God, we need you and we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The music is playing. I think the invitation is clear. Would you do business with God tonight? If you don't know for sure that you're saved, would you come up here to me? I'd be happy to guide you to someone who can show you from the Bible how you could be saved. Would you take some time tonight to ponder your heart and see, is there any unforgiveness in your heart? Don't be afraid. Oh, Brother Justin, if I think about it, it brings up too much pain and too much hurt. Start the healing tonight by forgiving. You're not approving what was done. You're starting your healing process with Almighty God. What a patient God we have. What a loving God. for sure that we're forgiven by you, God. 
And Lord, in your word, you said, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. God, I thank you that we, we can have forgiveness through you. And that because of that, it gives us peace with you, Lord. And, and if we walk close to you, if we're, if we're not living in sin, if we're doing our best to do right, Lord, then we can have the peace of God. And God, I just, I thank you, Lord. I thank you for your word. I thank you for the message tonight, God. I pray, Lord, I pray you'd help me to take heed to it. I pray you'd help us all to take heed to it. God, I pray that for any of us, Lord, that are struggle, struggling, Lord, with any unforgiveness in our heart, I pray that you'd help us, Lord. Help us to forgive. Help us, Lord. Help us to have perfect forgiveness, even as you do, God. And uh, God, I, I, I just thank you for the message tonight, Lord. And, Lord, I pray again that you be with Pastor, Lord. Help him, Lord, as he gets ready to preach in, in only just a moment, God. Pray you'd help him and use him. We love you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I think, I think that was a, uh, a timely message, you know, and uh, I think that was definitely from the Lord. And, you know, if you were helped by the message, we say amen. Amen. So, Brother Justin, we, we appreciate that, brother. Um, love the Word of God. Love the Bible. And was every, everything he said was Bible. Yeah. If you have any doubts about anything, if it wasn't, just check it. Check them. You got the book right in your lap. You can check it. But that's all Bible. And, uh, and I appreciate the message. And uh, so, after you tell uh, Brother Justin one thing that you like from the message, then you are dismissed. All right. <laughs> Try to get you to bum rush her.